Welcome back to Tucson, Arizona. This is the four-man icebreaker challenge, and we're down to just two matches, third place and the finals. Dave, this one is the third place final between Sam Esser and Abraham Montijo. Our referee is Vern Roberts. This is going to be a good one. Sam and Abe both losing their opening matches, but now still have a lot to play for here. They want to go home with that winning feeling. Abraham had the winning feeling last year in Toledo where he made the final his best ever result in a national championship, defeating Leo Canales Jr. in the semifinals there. This tournament, Dave, I just wanted to say this really quickly, is one that we're doing to try to break the ice so people can get back onto the handball court safely and uh, not necessarily follow our lead, but just say, hey, this can be done. You can put your players in a bubble like we did. Mm -hmm. You can wear your face mask, all of our referees are, we have Vern Roberts and, and Matt Kruger, line judges also wearing them. The fans have them on, and they're also social distancing as we get underway here. What are we going to see from Abraham Montijo specifically? We saw Sam a couple days ago when we did the first match. But does Abe have a well-rounded game like Shorty? Does he have some tricks out there? Well, Abe's got a very good deep serve with a lot of hop. You saw it right there. But both these guys are ralliers. You know, they don't really go for the bottom board unless they really have that opportunity. So I think we're going to see a lot of long rallies in this match. I remember playing Abraham when I first moved to Tucson 2009 on a three-wall court, and the one thing that I left the court knowing was that Abe's deep serve is absolutely amazing. Yeah, and when he tremendous. does it with power, mm -hmm. it can be unstoppable in a way if you can't get that serve back. Well, Abe and I trained for the three-wall nationals he was going and i was playing him to get him ready last year these courts weren't yet built we were playing at freedom park where the the sidewall stops at the back line so he was hopping a lot of balls out of the court unreturnable now here you don't really have that option because that ball will clip the back of the sidewall and keep the ball in play but i would say that's definitely in the strength of his game is that deep power serve also, no roof at Freedom Park. Right. Like there is here. There was an air there from and that's, Sam Esser. That's actually where I played Abraham, and mm -hmm. he was just hitting balls so hard out that door. You you want to play on the long line, but you find yourself one, drifting back two or three feet mm -hmm. because you're trying to protect those corners. This is already one of the longest rallies we've seen in the tournament, and it's still going. And it ends with an air there. 16 shots. I think that was a piece of Abraham's shoe that just came off. Mm. Now, is there a rule of thumb on those balls that are deep and they clip the side wall? Do you always just say, I'm playing the side wall? The tweeners, the ones that you aren't sure? Or do you. I think you have to be ready for both. You have to be alert enough that the ball can go straight out or it can clip the side wall. Similar in four wall, when you take those back wall shots and you're not sure if they're going to hit the floor, then the side wall, or just come straight out. So you have to be ready for both. And you've got to be really mentally sharp to be prepared to play those kind of shots because well, if you're just guessing 50 percent of the time you're going to be aced there's a nice deep two wall pass winner from abe when sam first moved to town abe just crushed sam on these courts and since then it's become more competitive between the two in practice matches.
It's interesting, Dave, watching from our viewpoint, 30 or 40 feet behind the court. It looks like those could be hinders even when you're watching on video, but when you're in the court, you never really feel like you're being crowded. And Vern Roberts, our referee, has enough experience to know to let the play continue there. I believe there really shouldn't be any screens called in three wall either. A lot of those serves that are called screens are often the easiest ones to return. They're right in the middle of the court. That's the serve you want to return, not that. Is that because your opponent's playing back maybe eight feet more than they would if they were in a four wall court and they're able to see around? Well, it's, it's possible that that's the reason, but you know, in three wall, it's much harder to return the ball from the corners at the 40 foot or 45 foot mark than it is the ball right down the middle of the court. That's where you want to return from. Now you have the angles and the room. So every time I see a screen called or if a screen's called when I'm return returning, I cringe. That's the shot you want to hit. How do you feel when there's a uh, foot fault being called? <laughs> oh, are we going down this road? <laughs> no. <laughs> Good. Just thought I'd ask. Yeah, okay. I'm being diplomatic here. So, I don't feel good about it. I have that feeling. Yeah. It's a good serve there from Sam. When he goes deep like that, he ups his game. Mm -hmm. As an opponent, now he goes for that little crack right here. He went for it. Well, at least he's got the mindset to do it right. You have to right. hand him that. But then again, Dave, when you hit that great deep serve, See, now that's a serve A would run return, but don't you want to stick with that feeling that you have and just keep putting it in that same spot? I, yes. Because even if they know it's coming, if you land the ball six inches from that back line, what are they going to do about it? No, I totally agree with you. So in that sense, I say why switch it up because get in the groove of hitting that perfect serve deep. I don't think you should go back and forth at any time, to be honest. And that ball almost makes it. But, you know, I remember watching Chapman, who's to me the greatest three wall I've ever seen. But he just hit the same serve every time. He stood on the right wall and hit it out the left. You knew it was going there. No, I, I agree because it makes you feel uncomfortable. I think if you can hit that crack because your opponent got lazy and deep, uh -huh. then I think that's fine. But I don't think you should go back and forth. Mm -hmm. I think you can do that in four wall sometimes and get by with it. But I, th I really do believe the best serve in three wall is deep. Mm-hmm to your opponent's weakest hand. Yeah. And if you can get it out the door, then that, that's even a bonus. That's a nice serve from Sam. Sets this shot up. Let's not get behind him. Not sure what happened there. Five, eight. Five serving eight here. So remember, in Sam's first two games of this tournament, Dave, again, Shorty, he had huge leads and lost. Now he's trailing. And a timeout called from Sam Esser. And Abe's got Sam playing his game. This long, grueling rallies force him to play a lot of balls overhand. It takes a lot of experience on the three-wall court to feel comfortable playing the ball overhand. Score here is 8-5 to five in game number one. This is the third place men's final in Tucson, Arizona. Third place, day number three, court number three. Of the icebreaker challenge, four man icebreaker challenge, basically breaking the ice to show you that it can be done. You can actually hold tournaments still and properly social distance yourself like we are here in Tucson, Arizona. Well, this event is checking all the boxes. First of all, we're outside where it's much less likely to catch those respiratory particles that give the virus, and also you're limiting the number of people, which of course reduces your chances. And in our case, we just didn't tell anybody. Right. Instead of limiting uh, these people from being out here, uh, anybody could have show, shown up as long as they followed the park rules. 
Amazingly, though, it's the same people that watch the Race Freight Final and just as many. <laughs> and I'm not joking. No, you are. I wish I was. No, you are. <laughs> uh, let's just pan out to that crowd at a Race Final. <laughs> <laughs> you have footage of that? As much footage of that as I have of this. <laughs> yeah. So I guess it's just our words then. Yep. Yeah. 11 5 here, Abe. Hey, if Abraham served me that screen ball, I would be so upset if the referee stopped. Right. Because what Abe gives you on the very next serve is yes. one that's almost impossible to get back. That's I, what, I, that's I take what I'm that, trying to say. I take that screen. Yes. It's very rare in three while you get a chance to just take a full swing at a ball. And the only time you get those are on what the referee calls screen serves because they're down the middle. You're not going to take a full swing with the ball merging into the side wall one inch from the back line. There's a nice left from Sam. Well, Aber's ready for that serve. So he knows. He's looking in. Boy, that ball had a lot of spin with Abraham's punch left. Looked like it was going to target back toward the center, and instead it dropped back to the left. Did the ball break? I mean, it... I guess not. But that was a weird way of that ball coming back. We don't have any lines on these courts. On the, No strange bad bounces either. Pretty solid. There's a nice ace serve from Abe. Catches the crack at about the 34-foot mark. I like these long serves. I mean, mm -hmm. I, as, an, a, as a spectator, they right. may not be the greatest thing, but as a server it, or somebody that could be coaching Abraham and you saw Shorty in the previous one a couple days ago, it, it's they're going for those long serves. Yeah. Well, you saw Abe get a quick point there with an overhand, almost like a lob serve. And that's a bad shot from Abe and a worse air from Sam. But Abe might want to think about going to that high overhand serve because Sam didn't seem to have an answer for it. I like it, too. The one down the right or the yeah. left? Yeah, well, either. That one that Abe has down the right, he can control it so much better. Mm -hmm. And it seems like he can almost bounce it out of the court right. if, he does it, if you don't step in and take it. Yeah. But sometimes as a server, you don't want to start off the rally, especially in three-wall with kind of a lob serve. You kind of have that adrenaline. You want to hit it hard and deep. But if you... You know, if you were to sit back and really take a look at what you're getting out of that lob serve, statistically it might make more sense. And that's just out. <laughs> 6 14. Sam is way down here. There's a nice three wall return. Sam takes that with his right. Now, Abraham did not look good on day number two when he played you, Dave, but he looks like the guy that made the finals of the Nationals last year hmm. in this little stretch run. Okay. His serves are amazing right now. It's a pretty good return from Sam. Really good. Sam should not have won that rally. No, but somehow he puts that ball back in play from court four. Yeah, that's tough. With his left. Kind of shows you what you need to do. It's it's You only have about two options if you're going to maintain a rally from that deep. Now, why would a right-handed player run into the right side wall to use his left? You know, when they're not a, just saw When Sam they're not do. a right-handed... Yeah, right. Sam? I've never seen a right-handed player run himself into the right wall to use his left. But he serves right-handed. He's sort of like an Alan Garner in that yes. sense. I don't think Alan's completely a, a righty. Mondo Ortiz, same way. Well, he has that little shot. That little underhand paddle. 
That's going to bring him places, just that one alone. Sometimes the best shots are the ones you leave, but that one was not the right leave. I think the great Vern Roberts once said that if if you question whether or not it's going to be deep, you have to play it. Mm. So if it's just even a thought in your head, like, you know, I might, let's just see if this one's going to make it, then there's a good chance it's going to make it. But what if, you know, your only shot on that ball is just to fall backwards and float it back, and they're going to kill that 95% of the time, or there's a 50% chance it's going to go deep. Are you going to go through all these stats in your head when you're, when you're running back? I, I do. Mean, so I'm when, thinking in my head. If I hit this, there's a 95% chance he's going to kill the next shot. If I don't hit it and let it go, there's a 50% well, chance in, I'm going to win that the point. Case, in that case, let it go. But not a lot of people are going through the analytics like that. Oh, well. Have you ever thought about being an insurance claim adjuster? <laughs> Geico is hiring. <laughs> See what Abe does here. Mm. Nice shot. Yeah, beautiful. Well, Abe didn't hit the shot he was trying to hit, but it ended up in a pretty good spot. And Sam just throttles that kill in the left corner from 36 feet. And, you know, Sam plays points like that. The last three shots he hits are absolutely amazing. You say, well, how can anyone stop you? Well, I think it comes down to his footwork. Okay. I think that when he has the feet in the right position, he does the right thing. And there's three perfect points in a row from Sam. He gets the side out, and now two first strike kills. Using both hands to get those kills. Good ball. And now another first strike winner. So three points in a row on six shots. Great efficiency. And it's another ball that Abe lets go by, and it actually right. stayed in. But I know how you would thought on that if I would hit it. <laughs> well, it also depends on where I would be on the court, what kind of return I thought I could hit. And I want to get to the point where I just catch that ball instead of wasting time hitting it into the screen or over the court, knowing I can't get it back, which I can't. Just catch it. Do the mature thing. Nobody wants to run over to the tennis courts and try and chase that ball that you had no chance to hit back anyway. Well, I know that in one of these matches, or one of the outdoor matches I've watched you play, you didn't like the ball. The referee said they weren't going to change it, so you just, on the return of serve, jacked it into the <laughs> tennis courts. So That's... you knew somebody had to go chase that. It wasn't going to be you, but... It was a they mishit. Weren't, they weren't, <laughs> they weren't going to change the ball. <laughs> had a crack in it or something and then you said it was flat and so you just jacked it as hard as you could over the it would have gone a lot farther if it wasn't flat <laughs> Abe gets a lob serve ace straight down the right wall gets him that 17 point and he doesn't go back to that serve so the two times he's hit that lob serve Dave he's hit aces well, the return hasn't come back. He actually hit it three times. Okay. And the third, the first time he did it and he didn't get the ace, I said to myself, next time I'm out there, I need to go practice that shot. Because it, it, to me, it was like, oh, you got your perfect position. Uh -huh. I mean, it is to your opponent's strong hand, but then again, this is Sam, and he might not be a righty. But also, your opponent's leaning left because they're expecting the serves to go to the left, especially if you're going to hit an overhand serve. So now they're having to run across the court. That's going to be tough. Yeah, and Sam does the right thing. Don't bother swinging there. That ball is behind you, and there's no way you can win the point from there. That ball hit our camera, in fact. Mm. Big thanks out to Vern Roberts from the United States Handball Association for refing this match. 
I'm just glad Vern didn't bike here. Good person. Twelve to eighteen. And it ends with an air there. There's an air from Sam. How frustrating is it for Sam when he has some leads? Or if he makes a comeback and then his opponent then flips the switch. Seems like we've seen it a couple times in this tournament. Abraham on a roll now. A beautiful shot there from Sam. Well, Sam's played from behind this entire first game here. 13-19. 13-19 now. He's never been closer than six since about midway through this first game. Since he's been down 12-5, he's played about even, but he's never really gotten himself back in. And there's a double fault. Wow, that's tough. At 13-19? That's his third double fault of this event. That ball was deep. It's a good return from Sam. It's hard to get that shot perfectly down the wall without clipping the side wall, but he had the right touch there. There's that perfect sound in the right corner. Very systematic. Mm -hmm. 14 to 19 here. Sam Esser serving game number one, going to 21. This is a third place final. Sam Esser versus Abraham Montijo. Surprised Dave didn't go to the roof there. Guess it doesn't really matter. Sam makes it to the front wall and is just a couple feet away from getting that return from Abraham. But, you know, it, it's taken a lot out of you here with his son and all this constant running. These guys are definitely uh, putting in more of the longer rallies of the tournament that we've seen so far. A lot of acreage under their feet. And that's a terrible error there from Sam that gives Abe the 20th point. Flat-footed, off-balance, back foot. Not in the right place. Just kind of going all arm on a roundhouse swing with a fist. So far in this game, we've seen 17 rallies of six-plus shots. That's the most in any game so far in this event. Well, it's felt like it. Right. shot from Sam. He had a lot of options right there, and he it didn't seem like he took the right option. Well, Sam unquestionably played his worst handball at the final moments of all three games he's played so right. far in this tournament. I mean, up 14-7 to seven against Shorty in the first game, loses. 12-1, to one, second game against Shorty, loses. Here, he's down the whole game, but he kind of felt like he had some chances there late in that first game, but he just did not capitalize. Made a couple of errors, a couple of bad decisions, and he drops that first game. Well, it seemed like he had a nice run. Uh, or, or like a potential of a nice run. I, right, you he, felt he never, like it yeah, was... Yeah, it was happening, but then some lazy footwork. But at times, he, when he gets, like I said earlier, systematic... It's, it, Sam made 14 errors in that first game. Yeeks. That's a lot of errors. That's the most we've seen of any yes. match, I believe. Hard to overcome. Sam with only one ace in that first game. So he's having to win... You know, having to make a lot of great shots to win rallies. Abe with five aces in that first game. One serve zero. Had to change a battery there on one of our cameras. The only important statistical category that Sam led 
was left hand rally enders. Hmm. Sam had seven of those, Abe with three. But the rest of the important statistics went in favor of Abraham. Well, it doesn't mean necessarily if you have seven and Abe has three, it, you might have had seven opportunities and Abe didn't have that many. Right. But overall rally ending shots, Sam with 17, Abe with 13. Wow. But yet Abe still wins that game 21-14. A lot of that due to the serve. The serve and the airs. Yeah. Five more airs, four more aces. That tells the story. You, you watch these back, Dave, and say a lot of wasted energy hitting the ball back down the middle of the court again. You know, you, you see both of the players are playing close, and every shot seems to hit the front wall, side wall, come right back at yourself. And then your opponent has a free lane to hit it down, and they do the same thing. I think everyone's trying to hit it down the lane, mm -hmm. but then instead they check it up in the middle of the court. And you watch back and say, what am I doing? But when you're out there playing, it... I don't know what happens, but it, it seems like it just... Well, there's certain angles and spins on the ball that, you know, it makes it difficult to hit the ball straight down the wall, even though you're trying. So a lot of the balls that you're trying to hit down the wall hit the front wall, the side wall, and come out. See, this is one here, right back to the middle. That's a good shot, though. Any ceiling shot here that pushes your opponent back behind the back line, even if it's not an offensive rally-ending ceiling shot, is a good shot. I mean, there's not, there's nothing you can do with that. I've never seen someone turn around and shoot that for a kill. So I think anytime you're able to hit the ceiling, you're at least in a neutral position. And that seems like the shot that Sam has not been able to ex execute late in the games. That corner kill. Seven to zero? Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Sam has to be saying, where was this run? At the end of last game. You see Vern Roberts writing with his left hand. Another one. One of the all-time greats yep. who, you know, everyone thought was right-handed. And there he is writing with his left. I played Vern Roberts, Dave, in 1997. One of the best players I've ever seen or played. Amazing. Never saw someone control the ball like that, especially with his left hand. I've played him in singles. No, no I, don't, I don't think I've done singles, but in doubles, gosh, just one of the best players to play against. You and I played him in 2013, and he was yeah. amazing. Yeah. I love playing on the court with Vern Roberts, whether you're with or against. He just... So cool, actually. Yeah, the ultimate gentleman on the court, too. Right. Very similar to Sam and Abe in that respect. Except for when I play Abraham, there's a lot of trash talking. Him trash talking me. Mm. You can't and blame you're not going to get that really from Vern, although he does it in his own little subtle way. But, but you're right. These guys are, are nice on the court. Tough serve. I think it's great, Dave, that a legend like Vern, who just retired after 50 years of working in handball every day, still wants to be around it, still coming out here and refereeing, wanting to be a part of it. Yeah, he volunteered. Right, and you know, Dave, during this quarantine, we've heard from a lot of our handball legends Jaime Paredes, Danny Bell, Nadia Alvarado Sr., Alan Garner, who I'm considering a legend since he's long retired. Wish these guys were around coming to the events. It means a lot to the sport to have them involved. It's a great rally here. One of the best ones of the tournament. Hands together there for Sam Esser for winning that rally.
See if Sam can get his serve going here and get some free points. He just one ace in that first game. And there's a return and serve kill from Abraham. But it didn't hit the roof, did it? No. You're calling that a kill? I call it a rally ender. Okay. A kill to me means a rally ender. A okay. shot that your opponent was unable to return. There is some sub subjectivity in it in that Sam actually touched that ball, but it still is recorded as an ace. That's not an error. 2-9. Two 2-9 nine. Two nine now. Abraham winning that first game, Dave, 21-14. So you're, you don't make up the stats like a lot of people say. You just make up how they're interpreted Well, in some cases. There is interpretation to some of these shots. See, that's, you, know, you have to differentiate between what's an error and what's a, a winner. You know, if somebody hits the ceiling and you're pushed back to the 60-foot mark, falling backwards, you get your hand on it, but you don't return it. I don't consider that an error. Right, I agree. I consider that a winning shot. Yeah, no, I agree with that. 11, two. In baseball, if you jumped over the fence to bring in a home run and it, you flub it off the bottom of your wrist, yeah. they're not going to give you an error for that. Right. What I don't understand about baseball is when a player loses the ball in the sun and just stands there trying to relocate it, and it bounces five feet in front of him. They give him an error for that. Oh, I didn't but, know that. And I don't like that because it, you don't, you, you never see it. But there is sometimes they don't. Right? There, there's times I think when they don't, but it's all about how it's interpreted by the official scorekeeper. Just sort of like the way you do it, mm -hmm. you interpret it differently, and just like a referee will interpret the football rule different from this tournament versus other, right. <laughs> other tournaments. Although we haven't seen it a lot yet here. It only happens in your matches. Big setup for Abe. Yeah. Now, could that be called an avoidable? I just think it should have been a no call. It seemed like there was enough room for him to play that shot. But there's no attempt to even get out of the way. So if you're going to call it a screen on that. Mm -hmm. That's why I think it's a no call. I like how Abraham went over there really quickly and planted his feet and then went over the top of that ball to keep it sliding down that left wall and a quick timeout now being called here from Sam Esser. And Abe is on the move here now. He was down 12-2. Now really working his way back into this game. Four-man icebreaker challenge in Tucson, Arizona. You're watching it live right here. Fans locally aren't down here, though, because we just didn't tell anybody. This is a safe social distancing, follow the pandemic rules tournament. Everybody's been in and out of the bubble. Wearing face masks. We have Vern Roberts here from the United States Handball Association as their referee. Earlier matches was Matt Kruger. Pretty good showing. I think Abraham playing Sean Lenning a lot when Sean lived in Tucson, Arizona, really helped out Abraham's three wall game. He's a little bit more creative. That might be out. Let's listen in for the score here. Sam has made some strange errors here. And Sam has left a couple of balls that he could have hit that landed well inside the back line that he thought were going to be long. Sam is the youngest player in this tournament. But he's mature beyond his age. Well, I was going to say the youngest, but most tired player in the tournament. Well, we had a good conversation about hiking trails. Mm. And he 
contacted me to ask me more information about a trail that I felt would get him into shape within two weeks. So hiking's going to get you in shape? It, it does. Really? I mean, the last time I played was with you and Danny Perez, and I hadn't hit a handball in months. And I felt like I was pretty quick out there for me. Yeah, you played well that day. And that was because of that hiking trail. Mm. You have to use your whole body. Mm. It's like rock climbing mixed in with hiking, and you have to do it kind of somewhat quick because there's snakes everywhere. So if nobody hears from Sam in the next <laughs> in the next week, and another point here for Abraham Montijo. Most of Sam's left hand return to serve errors are coming because he's lifting that right foot, the front foot off the ground. Instead of driving into that front side, he's falling back. There's really no stability there. And that causes a lot of hand errors when that front foot comes off the ground. That hits A, but was not going to make it. Boy, that had a lot of hop to it there. Another return of serve air, though. Sam. It's like Sam hasn't figured out how hard that ball jams into that left side wall. And you imagine, you know, when you see a guy like Abraham play and even Sean Lenning, um, Sean Lenning's going to actually ruin my point here, but when John Bike was playing three wall, he was amazing. He hit the ball so hard, but with that hook into the side wall like that, there's no way to play both side wall and out the door, like you were talking about earlier right. when you're playing John Bike. You had to pick one of those. Mm -hmm. Hit the ball so hard, and then it would just take a 90 degree into the side wall, and that's a nice little kind of serving run here from Abraham Montijo, although that one was long. Tucson, Arizona, this is Clark Park on Alvernon. Good return from Sam. Terrible serve from Abraham. Abe went with that safe overhand lob and it clipped the side wall and Sam just stepped in and drove it down a wall. Yeah, I think that's a little inexperience right there from Sam, just letting that ball go out that side wall. You know, Sam has not played a lot of race stops. The stops he's played, he did pretty well. He lost to Daniel Cordova 15-13, 15-13 in the first round of Atlanta, the year that Daniel won that event. So he obviously played Daniel very tough there, but I think he's only had three race starts in his career. So he's won a lot of tournaments in the Midwest, a lot of open tournaments there, but... The temperature gets turned up just a little bit when you're playing against these top pros. And that's a terrible error there from Sam. But Dave, you know how it is. You were one of the top players in Oregon. Very competitive handball scene, but you step out onto that pro scene and it's a little bit different. It's very intimidating. And it's not always just the opponent you're playing, it's the whole environment. You step into it and it's, you're the odd guy out of every situation. And you're trying to fit in and you're trying to get some kind of confidence. You're trying to fit in? Me, I, I, back then I tried to. Oh. Now, I know that I never will. <laughs> but back then, you know, you step into that environment and you're trying to just find a way to get into some type of like normal routine. And it just, there isn't a normal routine at a pro stop. That's why the guys that, and you've seen it time and time, 
again, you, you have to go to these tournaments because you're yeah. just not going to one-off it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only person that seems to kind of do well in that sort of setting is Nick Mattiotti, who just sort of comes in and wins. Or I mean, you know, he does better than expected. Mm. He's not winning, but right. he's not intimidated at all by what, what he's up against. I guess that's what I'm saying. But even then, he's still not making it to finals. He's just qualifying every chance that he, mm-hmm. he gets when he plays. But Sam, you know, he just needs to play more tournaments. And then he'll be confident, and then he'll start winning. I can see him as being an Elite Eight guy. Oh, I definitely see that. Good shot from Abe. Look at that ball come back. Abe just feathers that out of his his ring finger and his pinky and lets it slide back down that right wall. You know, there's a way to hop the ball on the ground, and then there's a way to hop the ball on the on the front wall. An outdoor three wall, you could really see it exposed more than indoor, although it does happen on the indoor courts as well. Nice shot again from Abe. That ball just slicing down that left side wall. Oh, beautiful serve, Abe deep. Those balls are just impossible to get back. I mean, he, Sam, would have had to have played that ball that went out the left side door. He would have had to, the second was served, say to himself, it's going to hop all the way out and just play that. See again, off balance. Nice serve again from Abraham Montijo. 18 to 12 here. Make that 19. 17 straight points now for Abe, who is down 12 to 2. I mean, I know you have these stats, but if you looked at the stats of just the last five minutes Mm -hmm. of each one of Sam's games, Mm -hmm. We wouldn't even, I don't think you would even think he was a pro player. Right. And I'm not talking about just the score. I'm talking about the hand airs, the the ace serves against. It's a good shot right there from Abe. This is it. Match point. Ball sounded like a broke. See if Abe goes with a lob serve here. Second serve. Well, last time he did, he clipped the sidewall deep and it I went right see to. That happening again. Went right, yeah, he does it. Let's see if he did, misses that there. That's that's such a great serve. So and he, he does it. Pretty much automatic on points with that I mean, serve. I, I think it's great. Again, I I just saw it for the first time on that first uh, serve of the match, and I said to myself immediately. I need to go and practice that. Just go in there and practice that. Get a, a bucket of balls and just try to make it feather out. Let's the look at some of the stats here, Dave. The serve was really the difference there in that second game. Abraham with eight aces. He ended the match with his eighth ace. Sam with just two aces in that second game. Just three aces for the, the match. Just not enough to compete at this level. The rest of the stats pretty even in that game. Abraham winning seven of the 11 six-plus shot rallies, both making seven airs and pretty close in the rally ending shots but you have to have a devastating serve in this outdoor game and indoor game if you want to compete you're just giving away too many points abraham with like i said eight aces in that first game five in the five in the first game eight in the second game that's 13 aces out of his 42 points sam with just three points coming on ace serves when sam started making some hand airs abe just was relentless Right. Well, we have the men's finals tomorrow. That's going to be you versus Shorty Ruiz. You've played him here. What makes him so difficult to play? Very good serve. He's got that power ceiling shot, and it's hard to read because he can kill from that paddle position or also go under it with the fist and hit it to the ceiling. So that that's a hard shot to read. It's like a, what, a 40-foot difference? At least. Right. And he's got a very good overhand game. He's comfortable playing the ball overhand with either hand. He's got the ability to control the ball high and hit it down the walls. So would you say he's creative on the court, or is he just uh, has a standard sort of uh, mechanism that he puts in each particular day? 
Well, I think he's the best at using the ceiling, he and Tyree. They use it a little bit differently, but I would say similar in that they can use the ceiling for offense better than anybody. So that's a shot that you have to try and prevent them from hitting. I mean, if you're just going to return the ball short, then they, you're giving Shorty the opportunity to punch that ball to the ceiling, and then you're out of the rally. So you have to figure out a way to return the ball so you can see the next shot. It is the four-man icebreaker challenge brought to you by patreon.com slash WPH live as we are showing you how you can do it in these times where we're in the middle of a pandemic and you're needing to social distance, you're needing to follow the guidelines, the rules from the city or your, your club. Well, you can get back into it and you can do it if you control everything. And that's what we've done with these players, the referees wearing face masks, the fans are social distancing themselves and the players are also in the bubble and they're playing in the tournament and enjoying themselves. So it can be done. We're breaking the ice. The four man icebreaker challenge will conclude tomorrow with the men's finals. David Fink versus Shorty Ruiz. Dave, thanks for joining us here today. We'll Thank be back for having me. with uh, more handball tomorrow. Good luck tomorrow. Thank you. With WPHlive.tv.